Hi, everybody. This is Joe Zisk. I'm the moderator of, of this session, and welcome to Transforming the, Transforming the Teaching and Learning Environment, the 2013 Apache Virtual Conference. The session today is one of the many 60-hour long sessions that we have that will go up until tomorrow, February 22nd. For those of you who may be new to Blackboard Collaborate, please make sure to mute your mic. That means don't push the talk button until you're ready to speak. And then when you're done speaking, please turn it off. You can also use the text chat window at any time to add comments or to ask questions. You can also click on your raise the hand button to indicate that you would like to speak. you will be recognized in the order that you raise your hand. As a reminder, all sessions are closed captioned. To turn on the captioning, just click on the closed caption icon above the video window, and you could do the same thing to turn off the capturing icon. In fact, today's session, Video Capturing for Accessibility, Penn State Demos Its Solution, will be starting in just a few moments. And we have three presenters. And uh, I'll start off by handing off to Josh Miller. He's from uh, Three Play Media, and then he will introduce the other folks and begin the presentation. Josh, can you please begin? Great, thanks, Bob. Um, so my name is Josh Miller, and I am one of the founders of Three Play Media, where we focus on making video content more accessible through transcription and closed captioning. Uh, so I'm going to start off by going through a a uh, quick overview of what closed captions are and some of the relevant legislation. And then I'm going to turn it over to Keith Bailey from Penn State, who's going to actually demonstrate uh, the solution they've built around creating accessible media. So what are closed captions uh, from the very beginning here? Uh, captioning refers to the process of taking an audio track and transcribing it into text to then synchronize that text with the media. Closed captions are typically located underneath a video or overlaid on top. Um, in addition to spoken words, captions convey all meaning and include sound effects. And this is a key difference from subtitles, and they're often uh, kind of confused with each other. Uh, closed captions originated in the early 1980s by an FCC mandate that applied to broadcast television. And now that online video is rapidly becoming the dominant medium, captioning laws and practices are proliferating there as well. So some basic terminology, uh, captioning versus transcription. A transcript is usually a text document without any time information. On the other hand, captions are time synchronized with the media. You can make captions from a transcript by breaking the text up into small segments called caption frames and then synchronizing them with the media such that each caption frame is displayed at the right time. Captioning versus subtitling. The difference between captions and subtitles is that subtitles are intended for viewers who do not have a hearing impairment, but may, but may not understand the language uh, that is being, uh, the, the content is being displayed in. Subtitles capture the spoken content, but not necessarily the sound effects. So for web video, it's possible to create multilingual subtitles and display that with your video. The difference between closed captioning and open captioning is that closed captions can be turned on or off by the viewer, while open captions are burned into the video and cannot be turned off. Most web video allows for closed captions so that it's a better viewer experience. Post-production means that the captioning process occurs offline and usually takes a few days to complete, whereas real-time captioning, as you're seeing here in this session, is done by live captioners. And there are certainly advantages and disadvantages of each process, depending on what it is you're doing. So how are captions used? Uh, with online media, there are actually quite a few applications that go well beyond uh, just the kind of obvious uh, hearing impairment requirements. Uh, and we actually uh, have a number of guides on how to handle the fact that with web media, uh, every web player kind of handles captions differently. Uh, so we have a number of guides on our website you can find on the how-to page, or the how it works page, I should say, uh, that will explain kind of how to add captions to different types of media players. 
So a quick overview of some of the accessibility laws that are in place now. Section 508 is a fairly broad law that requires all federal electronic and information technology to be accessible to people with disabilities, including employees and the public. For video, this means that captions must be added. For podcasts and audio files, a transcript is usually sufficient. Section 504 enables or entitles people with disabilities to equal access to any program or activity that receives federal subsidy. Web-based communications for educational institutions and government agencies are covered by this as well. Section 504 and 508 are both from the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, many states have also enacted similar legislation to Section 504 and 508, um, oftentimes even the exact language. Um, then the 21st Century Video Communications and Accessibility Act, uh, which is often referred to as the CVAA, was signed into law in October of 2010. This expands closed captioning requirements for all online video that previously aired on television. Uh, and there is expanding legislation that will eventually move beyond just network television, uh, certainly being discussed right now also. Uh, and some of the uh, milestones have already begun. So there are already requirements in place for uh, network television providers to actually get captions on their video once it's up online. So a little bit about the benefits of captioning. And you know, with the internet and being the internet, uh, there, there really are more benefits than what you would be used to with just traditional television. Um, the, the most obvious is it makes video content accessible for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, this is really important um, and you know, should not be overlooked. The nice thing is, uh, as I was getting alluding to, is that there are a number of benefits for people who can hear as well. Uh, specifically, captions will improve the comprehension and remove language barriers for people who know English as a second language. Uh, captions also compensate for poor quality of audio uh, or a noisy background or certainly allow the media to be consumed in a sound-sensitive environment like a workplace or a library. So if someone's not supposed to put the sound on, they can actually follow along still. Uh, from search engine optimization, that's certainly a, a big thing for a number of organizations, um, but also just search in general. So the idea of having synchronized text with your video really makes it possible to use the text as a navigation tool and, and actually go to a part of your video based on that timed text. Um, and then certainly once that video has been found, it just allows for um, content to be reused, uh, found more efficiently. It's a huge learning tool that way. Uh, for example, if you're looking for something in a one-hour lecture, you can actually jump to the exact point in the video um, if the captions have been uh, applied or, or published in, the, in a certain way. We also have a number of tools that we call an interactive transcript uh, that allow you to use that text as the, the searching tool. Um, and then finally, transcription and captioning is a, is a really important piece if you want to translate. So if you do want to reach a global audience or if you do want to reach a, an audience that speaks a different language, um, the, the captioning is the first step. And so if you adding subtitles uh, is, is something that really gets enabled by having captions. What we do at 3Play is really try to make this process easier. Um, all, you know, our whole focus is um, high quality captions at a reasonable rate uh, that can be done without, you know, recreating a huge workflow. And so we really try to make it as simple as upload, download, publish. Uh, just a little bit about captioning formats, and this gets into, you know, making it simple means being flexible. So we produce in about 20 different caption and transcript formats, actually, and here's a, a list of some of the common ones. Uh, this is this is the kind of the reality of, of web captioning is that each player kind of does things a little bit differently, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and so it's, it's important to make sure you're getting the right caption format um, and apply that to your video. Um, as easily as possible. And so these are just some of the examples. 
Um, another part of making the process simple is integrating with existing platforms. Uh, so we have out-of-the-box integrations with a number of different video players and platforms and lecture capture systems so that once the, kind of this linkage is created between your accounts, uh, which literally will take a matter of minutes, uh, it's very easy to request a file to be captioned, have those captions be there, have the, and then have the captions be sent automatically to the right place for publishing with, with very, very little effort. Um, so uh, again, it's all about making this process easy so you're not relearning systems or even implementing new systems um, that take more than just a few minutes to get going. Um, the other thing, and you're going to see this with, with Keith's presentation, is that we have a, an API that can be used to build your own workflow. Um, so again, you know, really enabling people to do things in the most flexible way possible so that um, captioning isn't something that has to be really thought through carefully. It can just be done so that um, you know, everyone who needs them can get them. Uh, a couple things we've done is create uh, uh, basically embeddable plugins. Uh, this one is what we call the captions plugin. So for video players that maybe don't support captions very well, such as Vimeo, you can still add captions to that video. Or maybe you have a there's a YouTube video you want to show, uh, but it's not yours. So this is a way you can actually wrap the caption track around the video when you publish it on a page, um, and it's done very very easily. Um, one of the nice things about this captions plugin we built is it supports uh, search as well as multiple languages if you do go through the process of adding, uh, creating subtitles. Um, so in this case, you can actually use the caption text as a searching a search criteria. So you can search by keyword and jump to a point in the video all off of the captions. Uh, another service that we actually recently launched is the ability to take an existing transcript and add the time codes to create closed captions. Uh, that way you would be able to, um, you know, say you have a process that where you have a script that exists already for a video, you could add that, you know, submit that with your video to us, we'll add the timing, create the closed captions, and you're ready to go. And then I mentioned translations. We've actually inter fully integrated a translation process with our system uh, with multiple pricing tiers so that um, depending on the quality you require, you can actually kind of match that up with your budget, um, easily select any language you want, and then even edit the, the output afterwards. So we have a whole editing interface uh, for the subtitles so that if you want to make changes, you can do that on the fly. And as I mentioned, we, we do offer a number of uh, interactive embeddable widgets that will tie into a video player on a page so that the text kind of really comes alive and becomes a navigation tool as well as an accessibility tool. Uh, so you can now click on a word, jump to that part of the video, search within a single video by keyword, or even search across many videos uh, at the same time and jump to an exact point based on your search results. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Keith Bailey. Um, Keith is the Assistant Dean of Online Learning at the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State University, and he's going to walk through the captioning solution that they've built. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for that introduction and uh, the background to, to captioning. Um, I'm going to start off, I'm going to kind of give the, the, the background and the context by which this all came about. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, of information about Penn State University, uh, who we are, how, how we're structured, and how online education has grown to a point where we needed to think about uh, how transcription actually impacts us on a daily basis. So many of you may know this, uh, living in the state, we are a 24 campus system with one virtual campus kind of spread throughout the state. We are a land-grant uh, university, so we do fit under that, that federal regulation of uh, making things accessible for our students. Um, and it's not only a good thing to do, but it is a requirement of, of us as well. So, you know, we have taken, that, taken this on very passionately and uh, are doing what we can to, to streamline our efforts throughout uh, our growth in online education. Now, a little bit about myself. I'm the Assistant Dean for Online Learning in the College of Arts and Architecture. 
Um, I run a unit called the eLearning Institute, which is focused on uh, one of the colleges, one of the 13 colleges at, at the uh, main campus at University Park. And uh, my, my uh, oversight is in, in the following disciplines that are, are demonstrated on the screen here from architecture, art history, visual arts, music, theater. So we are a very uh, visual uh, and, and culture and rely a lot on media. So, you know, transcription, as you can imagine, plays a very integral role in, in a lot of what um, we produce and how we deliver our materials in, in more of an online format. So then just to kind of look at the delivery mechanisms that we have at the university, given uh, the, the reach out past um, any single campus, we have a couple of different ways of delivering our online courses at the university. Uh, many of you probably are aware of the World Campus, which is our 25th campus, actually. And it, it is the, the campus that if a student does not exist, uh, is enrolled at any one of the 24 campuses and are taking courses online, they are part of the World Campus. Um, and then we have something called the eLearning Cooperative, which allows us to actually deliver any one of our courses to any one of the campuses, uh, as long as they're fully online. And there's a mechanism to do that and allow students to enroll in those courses. And then, of course, we have uh, each of the campuses independently can offer online courses to themselves. Our portfolio, just to start to demonstrate the need again, is uh, you, can, you can see what uh, we produce in the way of online education. Uh, we have 55 courses online. We cover each one of our disciplines. We are very heavy in the general education, general arts. Uh, which is where a lot of our, our needs for accessibility uh, fit in. Every student at the university has to take six credits of general education, general arts, in order to graduate. Uh, thus, our portfolio is 31 courses in the general arts, general education um, arena. We deliver these courses at University Park. We deliver them through the World Campus, and we deliver them through the eLearning co Cooperative. So we reuse them, and that is part of our strategic mission in, in uh, online education here. We also have a Master's of Professional Studies in Art Education, um, a Digital Arts Certificate that is fully through the World Campus, as well as the MCS and Art Ed. Uh, we have Music Education, where we just have two online courses that are offered at University Park. And then we have a, a new degree coming out, a uh, fully online uh, degree in, in geodesign, which is going to be housed out of landscape architecture. So this is our portfolio. It doesn't represent the university, but it represents what we have to deal with and what I have to deal with on a daily basis uh, as part of the College of Arts and Architecture. So then we can look at the increasing need for accommodation in online education. And if we look at, at the university as a whole, um, in, in the 2011-12 fall spring semesters, we offered over 524,000 um, enrollments either at the World Campus, which is the WD designation, or at University Park. Uh, so we, we have an awful lot of enrollments that we, we manage. 9% uh, of, of those enrollments were actually called what we would consider as a web course, which is a fully online course, which would, is offered at World Campus or University Park. So 10% of our enrollments come from purely online uh, courses. Of those enrollments, you can see the breakdown is we're about 50-50 between what we offer at the World Campus and what we offer at University Park. Our portfolio here within the college, we offer 12,000 enrollments just within our own college every academic year um, and, and in an online environment. So students are taking them from the dorm rooms, they're taking them from wherever they are, but we can see that the, this trend is actually going to continue to go up. Our students are expecting it and, and um, we are helping to meet those demands by, by creating more online education for them. Um, so then, in uh, looking at accommodation requests, we have uh, ODS, which is our Office of Disability Services. And in the 2011-12 academic year, uh, you can see we had 1,140 registered needs through the Office of Disability Services. So our accommodations are pretty high, and we need to react pretty quickly to them once they come about. So the idea of streamlining a lot of this and developing uh, our online portfolio so that they accommodate these needs up front is of critical importance to us 
And that's part of our role here within the college is to, is to support that for our faculty internally. Um, in that academic year, we had six uh, students at the university that either needed captioning or interpretation done in the classroom. And that uh, went up by from four from the previous year. And that, that number continues to rise. And I can tell you this year, uh, just this semester, we've had, had three uh, needs for captioning in three different courses. And we were given about two to three days uh, in order to be able to accommodate that request. Um, in addition, we have five uh, visually disabled students, and, and some of which in varying levels of, of blindness, if you will. Uh, some of them are, are completely blind. Others have, a, um, have some form of, of vision and, and require uh, kind of larger image sizes and, and larger text format or captioning in order for them to be able to, to view it in a more timely fashion for themselves. So then if we look at the, the accommodations at the world campus, um, you can start to look at the numbers from fall of 11 to fall to spring of uh, 2012 as to the number of students that, it, that had accommodations come through and the number of unique courses that actually impact. So in spring of 12, we had 37 students enrolled at the world campus who had requests for um, uh, some, some form of uh, need in any of the courses. But that also impacted 82 courses. So it's not as simple as a, a single student coming in and needing a course. We understand that once, once that student matriculates in through the system, that we need to figure out how to accommodate as they move through their portfolio of courses and matriculate through to graduation. So it is important for us to keep on top of this as well and understand uh, proactively where the student sits and what they're going to um, need as they move forward through. So being proactive is, is a very important piece to this. We had um, three blind students enrolled in the World Campus, six, of, six courses being taken. And we know if they're an undergraduate student and uh, if someone came in with a, a need for visual um, accommodation, we are going to have to do that for at least two of our courses. So the question is which two, and how are we going to manage that? Deaf and hearing as well, um, nine students were enrolled and 27 unique courses. So our accommodation process, as I mentioned, we have the Office of Disability Services, but they, the student, there's a very defined process, which is, is very helpful to all of us, that the student has to disclose to the Office of Disability Services. We've had students actually come in and claim that they need a request without ever talking to ODS, and we have to refer them back to ODS in order to make the accommodation and uh, so that they can figure out what the accommodation is, an appropriate accommodation is. So the Office of Disability Services basically works with that student, documents the need, identifies it, and then communicates that with the faculty. So my learning design staff um, never really knows who the student is unless that is part of the accommodation but they are told specifically what needs to be accommodated. And, and then they have to go in and, and start to make those accommodations um, based on those needs. So the learning designer becomes a very critical role in this and um, in, in how they implement and coordinate the implementation of this. Um, it seems like a very simple, smooth process, but once the accommodations come in, it becomes very different because you make reasonable accommodations and sometimes that that becomes a negotiation and a talking point with the Office of Disability Services as to how to accommodate that. So now let's um, look at Penn State's learning design and how we have kind of structured the way we deliver our content to help with, with this and some of our processes and policies that are in place and how they impact our need to accommodate. So first and foremost, the, the university has actually established these 12 quality assurance design standards for all courses. And one of those, actually point number seven, is accessibility. So we realize the importance of it. We feel that we need to keep on top of it. As we're designing our courses and matching the courses to these learning design standards, we realize that accessibility is one of them. And we need to keep that in the back of our mind. So as we're picking media, as we're creating learning design strategies, or whatever we're including into the course experience, that we have to have in the back of our mind what a reasonable accommodation is for all of the different types of um, disabilities out there. 
So that becomes very difficult um, and, and is something that we have to explain to our faculty and work with our faculty. And it's become much more smooth over time as scenarios have come about. In addition, we've um, I put together a task force, um, and it's a quality initiative, which is looking at accessibility specific to online courseware. And really what we are trying to do is develop a process by which we can have our instructional designers and or our faculty identify best practices for implementation of online courseware. Looking at this and proactively documenting how accessible our courses are before the courses actually start. And we're always striving to be better. So we always want to modify and, and kind of tackle the things that we can tackle up front and make those accommodations that are needed as they come about. We also have a university policy um, on, on web accessibility, and it's called 8069. And um, as, as Josh was saying, there's 508 compliance. The university used to follow the 508 compliance, but we have recently moved to the WCAG, which is a, uh, a different form of 508 compliance. And from what we're hearing, that 508 is actually going to move in the direction of the WCAG at some point. But we've moved to a compliance level of AA. Um, and there are three levels to it. We, I, I'm not exactly sure the rationale behind why they chose AA, but um, it, is, it is a very grueling process, and I forget how many different standards there are, but um, you know, we, we have to be figuring out how to make those accommodations. And then the university said pages less than two years old must comply. Um, so that means any courses that we're creating now, we need to comply with the standard, and we need to train faculty to be able to do that. Um, older pages must be made accessible by the unit on a, by a determined date or by request on accommodation. So that's kind of uh, the, kind of the reactive approach, if you will. But we're, our unit is taking a very active role in this and trying to accommodate beforehand because once an accommodation comes about, there is a large scramble to make that accommodation come true, depending on the need that comes about. Um, there, we have also identified some key blockers, and uh, I won't go through the list of them, but you will notice that one of the key blockers to be fixed that we are saying have to be put into place for all courses is the video captioning and audio transcription. So that became a critical piece to all of this as, as we started to move forward. But then if we look at our learning design approach and, and how we have used that to not only enhance the quality of our courseware, but how we can use it to help with these accommodations. I'm going to take you through a little bit about our approach and how we've used the design to help influence um, accommodations up front and make things more accessible for our students through screen readers and or transcription and captioning. So one of the approaches that we've taken is we, we like to, to claim what we do is content separate from communication or keeping our content or course materials outside of the LMS. And this provides us with a lot of different opportunities. And, and as you can see on the screen right now, you know, we have a visual that goes along with each of these courses, which become very important, especially in a college like arts and architecture. Um, but then we use the co communication tools to do what it does really well, and that's the management of, of your class roster, your uh, drop boxes, your grading, and things like that. So then if we take that one step further, we, uh, we manage things in a content management system so we can keep our content separate from the interface, we can create the interfaces in certain ways, and then we mash them together to publish our content. And then we take that one step further. Not only is the content the design separated from one another, but we keep our media separate as well. And as I walk through the process, you will see why it is so important for us to keep our media outside of the content so we can make quick accessible uh, changes and have it happen replicably across the board as we um, implement media. So our solution here was really looking at three different pieces. Um, ELMS is an e-learning management system. That's what the acronym is. And we've developed a content management approach, a media management approach, and then an online studio to support kind of the art side of things. If we look at the content management, it's an open content management system based off of Drupal. Um, we've developed community module or used community modules, developed our own modules, kind of pulled it all together to manage all of our course content, and this is all of the content that is outside of the LMS. We also develop our own visuals um, in the form of themes, 
and or we can use kind of public themes. And one of the powers to that is we can develop these themes to be accessible. So when we look at, at our theme, we not only develop it to be visually appealing, but we develop it to be accessible up front and that a screen reader can move through it um, and get you to the content. We can do skip locks. We can you know, jump around as needed, but we can, we can ensure it. And so a faculty member doesn't have to manage that aspect of the visual look. Uh, in addition, the content editors, we have the ability to either add or take away controls based on those needs and the style sheets to make the content more accessible for the student as well. And um, screen readers can go through this very easily and we can modify and install modules to make this uh, available to our students. But the big debate always is, is how much power do you take away from the faculty by limiting the features versus the balance to making sure that things are accommodated up front. And we get in the debate all the time about whether it's an academic freedom and whether design is an academic freedom or not, or whether accessibility kind of trumps the need for design freedom. And we can debate that for hours upon hours, but we won't do that today. Um, this is an open distribution. We have a, a very open philosophy, so everything we develop is open and given back out to uh, the community. It's an ongoing development effort. So you can actually download a distribution of this off of um, Drupal.org. So now we get to, into the media, and this is where you know the video, the audio, and all of those assets are, are managed. And we built this basically to eliminate the duplication of media and allow for reuse across curriculum. We know that as we're offering this across the world campus, through the campuses and at our own campus, the same assets are being used and there's no need to duplicate, especially when we're talking about video. We wanted to simplify the workflow of copyright and transcription, uh, two of the more critical things of our 12 quality design standards. And we needed to make sure that we were compliant with copyright needs, whether we're using T-Chat, fair use, or however we're using it, we needed to make sure we were complying. And this, this uh, ELI media system helps us manage that. The system itself is built off of a Flash media server with a Drupal front end. Um, it manages the copyright of all of our digital assets. Uh, you can put images, video, audio files, PDFs, Word documents. We can put basically anything up there. It also then manages our transcription and our caption files associated with each of these systems. So now that I've kind of given you the background, let's, let's look at how we go about embedding one of these pieces of media from the media system into the, one of the courses. So I have a bunch of screenshots here to demonstrate how that would work. So if we look in this, this is the content management system. And you will see, or sorry, this is the ELI media system. This is a piece of uh, video lecture that was produced. It was captioned already. You can see the, the, um, the, the embed code that's down on the bottom. And all a learning designer or a faculty member has to do is copy that piece of material, paste it in the WYSIWYG editor, hit save, and it publishes it and it drops it right in. If there's a transcription file with that or a caption file, it will automatically appear within in, uh, the system and overlay on top of, of the video. If it does not exist and we go actually produce the transcript or the caption file and bring it back in, it will automatically appear through that embed code. So that is part of what we have built in the system. The benefits to us is that we have the, we feel that we are much more in compliance with Teach Act, um, fair use, creative commons. We can quantify all of our digital assets. We are much more accessible on things. We're in a position where we can now caption all of our media and, and know reliably that students have access to uh, the materials. We've removed the need for learning designers and faculty to manage the whole process and actually having to go upload the material and, and overlay um, the, the closed captioning on top of the video. And that became a very daunting process for, for many individuals. Uh, we also allow for tagging so we can easily retrieve this. Uh, in the media system, we can see exactly where it's being used in what courses so we know what the impact is if we change something or move something around. Again, this is an open distribution, giving back to, to the community and higher education at large. Um, so feel free to have a look at it and, and uh, check it out. So 
I'm going to go, go quickly over the, the transcription process, the evolution of what got us to where we are today. So if we look at it, back in 2006, we um, had this very manual method, and this is the cumbersome method, where we had uh, lecture files that if a, a faculty member had created, there were 39 flash files, and we had a student with um, uh, an audible disability that needed all of this transcribing. Well, we had to burn all of those on a disk. We had to send them to a company and mail them, physically mail them. It was 26 hours of lecture. It took two weeks for this to come back, and it was actually an open caption, not even a closed caption. So everybody had it, and there was no way of toggling it. So we, we looked at that and said, you know, this works. It was very costly. Uh, the turnaround was, was way too long, and it wasn't a very effective approach for us. But, it, but we made the accommodation and we did what we needed to do at that point in time. So what we went to do is we said, you know, we want to find a better solution. How are we going to do that? We need something that is going to be accurate, reliable, quick turnaround, quite affordable. We needed to do volume quickly. Um, we needed options for multiple formats so we could do transcription, we could do closed captioning, open captioning. We had the power to choose what we wanted to do. Um, we also wanted it to integrate with ELI Media. We're already managing our assets. How do we, how do we wrap this into it? So thank goodness, one day um, the, our instructional technologist, our manager of instructional design and myself were at a conference and we bumped into Josh and Toll at 3Play Media and we started talking to them about how we can do this and make this more efficient. So we've been working down that path for the last uh, several years trying to figure out how to make this better and better and better for us. And I will believe it's a win-win for both of us at this point. And I could give you many scenarios just within this last semester of how this has saved us. So going back to our evolution of where we are, the second phase of this was our partially automated system. So we took our core of ELI Media. All of our media assets are managed. Now, how do we manage the caption of, of this and associating it? So basically, the process was we would take a video, we would upload it to ELI Media. We would then upload it, in addition, to 3Play Media to get uh, the file put in and turned around. We would sit there, we would watch, and make sure to check to see if it was completed or when it was completed. Um, and it was typically a two to three day turnaround, which was great, so we could rely on going back to the site in, in two, to, two to three days to then have to go download it, pick our ex, uh, export format, then to upload it to the media. Um, and again, this was a daunting process, but it saved us an awful lot of time as well. So going back to that embed code, this automatically layered over top of the video, so any video that existed and we uploaded the caption file, automatically went with that video, and we could feel reliably safe that that media was then transcribed or, or captioned at that point. At that point in time, we didn't do anything with the transcription file, though. We didn't download it, we didn't upload it, and we didn't make it, make it available. Downloading two things versus the one thing, uploading things, it just it wasn't what we needed to do at the time. So, of course, we wanted to improve that, so we fully automated this, the process, and here's how we did that. So going back to the APIs and, and all of the wonderful tool sets that have come along with the three play media system, we utilize those APIs to automate the whole process from top to bottom. So now our media specialist uploads a piece of media into, three, into um, the ELI media system. They choose the course that it's associated to. They can that now classify that it needs transcription. That triggers an event for an approval to our um, instructional designer or instructional designers to say media is approved for transcription, learning designer, are you okay with it as a faculty member ready so we don't have to reproduce and waste a lot of time. Once these approvals have occurred, we can then submit it and hit execute to send to 3Play Media's uh, system for transcription and captioning. Once that happens, it automatically gets submitted. Uh, there's a cron job that runs every night, and it will look at, at the system, see which ones have been queued to be submitted, and they will all get pushed up to the system and get put into the queue. Uh, we don't have to see this screen, but this is showing that after we have submitted it, everything is in progress. Nightly then, our system looks 
at Free Play Media System to see if any of these are complete. If they are complete, they get they get downloaded immediately and then associated directly to that file. So we've eliminated the whole process. Now what we have done is we've streamlined the approval process so that we ensure that we are captioning what we need to caption and that it is done in a more efficient way. Just this semester, uh, one of our art history courses had um, a need for captioning. The course had not been captioned. I forget how many files. It is several hundred files we had to upload. I think we spent about $6,000 in all the lecturing files that, that were needed. But we were able to turn this around in, a, in less than a week to get it all done. So the, the value add was incredible. Um, proven results. Thus far, we, we've gone through and looked through our things 100% reliable. We've selected 10 of our more difficult images, uh, or I'm sorry, video files to, to demonstrate. Um, and you can see we've had well over 1,000 videos that we have pushed up. Um, we've had 5,700 or 571 of those files transcribed, two to three day turnaround, $13,000 cost. Some question me on that cost as to, well, boy, isn't that expensive? But that was over a two-year period of time. And if I were to hire a graduate student, which many people have said, well, what you need to do is hire a graduate student to do that, it would cost me more than that just in assistantship funds to pay for that individual with less reliability, shorter turnaround time, so forth and so on. The other thing is, is that we've been able to associate not only captioning files, but transcriptions and make a uh, a better need for um, English as second language students, which is probably one of the biggest areas of benefit that we have seen students come back and say, boy, that was really helpful to have that transcript or those caption files. Um, we have projected to save about 15 minutes per file uh, on a 12-hour course, so we have seen a, a huge benefit in, in um, how we have managed it. So I am going to stop at this point, and I'm going to turn it back off over um, to Josh so he can, can demonstrate uh, some of, of their tools, some of the cool new features that they're doing. Great. Thanks, Keith. I'll just wait for my screen to pop back up. All right. So I'm going to just quickly walk through a few implementations, talk a little bit about some of those automated workflows I mentioned before and uh, show you what some of these more interactive uh, searchable libraries might look like. Um, so this is just an example with uh, Ecto 360. Uh, so we have a number of integrations with the lecture capture systems that are commonly used. Um, and basically what all you have to do is once you set up that integration, you can very quickly request any echo to be captioned. And the way it'll work is that file will get, the, the, the media file will get sent to us. We'll transcribe it, create the captions, and post it back automatically for you. So as soon as it's ready, it'll show up with the, with the presentation. Um, same thing here is, is same idea with media site. This is an example. You see the captions on the left there, right below the video, and you can turn them on and off. Uh, and the, the concept is almost exactly the same. So so you have the option from your media site interface, just like with Echo, from the Echo interface, uh, you'd be able to request captions on the fly. And then finally, the Tegrity, again, same idea here. Um, you see the captions are just slightly higher in this case, right below the video. Um, it's a combined there in that window. Um, so again, very similar idea, uh, one time setup and then uh, request whenever needed. Uh, getting into some of the more interactive tools that we have, this is what we've done recently with MIT OpenCourseWare, uh, which incorporates both that concept of the interactive transcript and a what we call archive search. So you can actually search across an entire course load of videos uh, or lectures by keyword and then be able to find which lectures have that keyword and exactly where and be able to play from that point. Uh, so you can see the professor in the video is Speaking in this in this case, it's a YouTube video wrapped by uh, wrapped uh, with a JW player, um, and this will work with either one or both combined. Um, so you can see the word that he's speaking at the time is actually highlighted. Uh, there's a search window there on the left. Here I'll, I'll uh, scroll in here. Uh, so there's a search, so you can search within this video here, and then on the right here, if you want to search across the entire course load, you can 
uh, search in here, and then the results will be displayed. Uh, this is another example with the MIT Infinite History Project. Um, there are about 200 hours of content here, uh, a number of MIT luminaries. Uh, what you can do here is another example. This is actually more of a visual example of what happens when you uh, search across all of the interviews. And you can see they're all pretty long interviews. And then these will actually highlight where that word appears. So you can see where in the timeline your results are. And then you can click and, and jump to that part of the video. And here's that interactive transcript again. And that will switch as well. Um, one thing I should note is with the way we do things, um, this is in basically an included output option with our services. So there's no additional cost to implement this. Um, it's all plug and play. Um, and the, the formats are all included with any captioning we do. Uh, this is an example of what Al Jazeera recently did with one of the presidential debates. Uh, what you see here is actually an interface that they've customized using our time-synchronized transcripts. So it's the same concept of that interactive transcript. Um, it's just styled a little bit differently. And so they, they've actually customized all the styling uh, of the transcript. So each word, again, will be highlighted as spoken. Uh, what else, what, what the other part that they've done is pretty cool is they've customized the entire page around this idea of time text. So in this search here, you can search for a word. It'll tell you who said it using the speaker labels um, and kind of who, how often it was said. Um, and then here, it even shows you the timeline down below of who said it um, based on kind of segments of video and how many times within a certain segment uh, it was mentioned. So you can see there's a lot of talk about the Middle East right in here. Uh, so this is just an example to show just how flexible that output is. You can use it however you like uh, to kind of create these interactive, searchable, accessible experiences uh, once you've created time text. Uh, so wanted to put this up. We'll answer some questions. Uh, certainly feel free to be in touch with us. Um, and uh, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Good, thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, do we have any questions? You can either put them in the chat window, or you could just start speaking by picking on, by clicking on the talk button. So there is one question about uh, live uh, live media. I just wanted to quickly address everything that we do right now is based on recorded content. So uh, we don't actually do any live captioning ourselves. Uh, it's something that we've been talking with uh, a couple of organizations about possibly trying to offer in the future um, and, and then incorporating into our workflow. Uh, but we don't really have a timeline for that right now. So, so everything you're seeing that we're showing you in terms of workflows and interactive publication um, and captioning is all based on recorded content. So it does seem like by this incorporation with the three play media and the uh, videos that were being done at Penn State, it just really saved a lot of time in getting the transcripts put up there. And I like the fact that you could search through the transcripts to find keywords and, and, mm -hmm. and click on that part to start the video over again. So I think that would be very useful for all students. Yeah, as I mentioned, I, I, we, we found a huge benefit well outside of um, just the ability for, for people with disabilities, visual or audible disabilities, to, to use it. Um, you know, English as a second language is probably the biggest benefit out there. And the opportunity to not only have the captioning on top of it, but be able to download a transcript and be able to take notes on that and then watch the video again over and over and over is, is a huge benefit. And then, you know, we, we do run into scenarios where we have to accommodate someone and we, we legally can't transcribe it for everybody. So say it's a piece of digital material that we're using kind of under fair use, if you will, and it's a clip it from, let's say, Star Wars. And, you know, if we transcribe that and make that widely available as a transcript, that is an absolute no-no because we've created a transformative work in the form of a script that we, we would make broadly available to everyone. So the accommodation as it comes up is 
the student with that disability has access to the transcript, everybody else has access or um, the ability to see the captioning. So, you know, this type of a system allows us to have that type of flexibility to build that in and, and create that accommodation as needed. Okay, and also, once the uh, closed caption video is made and an embed code is generated, does the instructor get that code or is that, or is that being done by the instructional designer? Or how easy is it for the instructor to get that code? So the, the embed code itself that's in the system, that's auto-generated when, when the image is uploaded into the system. Um, then there's just kind of an expanding field where you open that up and you, you click on that embed code. You just copy it and then paste it over, over into uh, the content side. Now you can't just paste that anywhere. Uh, you can't go out to an open space and paste it in and hope that it moves through. It is a protected conduit between the two systems right now, so we can maintain that, that privacy and, that, and the, um, the copyright compliance, if you will. But once that, that embed code is there, right now our instructional designers do it. The faculty don't really um, see it that often, but they could. Um, but, you know, once that code is there, everything else happens along with it. We also theme it so that we can create styles that bring the, bring the copyright information along with the image and display it appropriately to, to stay compliant. And then it will bring the transcription once it's done along with that, that um, embed code as well. Okay, I just wanted to see how, how that was done. I guess at Penn State, uh, the instructors can't really change a course design too much without it being collaborated with an instructional designer and maybe other people on the team? Is that how it works at Penn State? Well, I won't say broadly at Penn State. Uh, that's how we are doing it within our own college right now. Um, you know, there are, there are other solutions that people are using. They're not uh, normally, they don't have the automated transcription pieces with it. But we do have a fair amount of faculty that will, will put things out in, on YouTube or Vimeo and need to transcribe and then, and then need some of the other services, kind of those overlay services, if you will. Um, but it is, it is unit to unit uh, based on who has access to what to be able to modify on their own. Um, in our case, I mean, we, we have our instructional designers do it for the faculty member. But, you know, we can, we can also open up access when a faculty member wants to do it, that they could have access to do it themselves. Okay, very good. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we come to a close? And the information, uh, their, their contact information is up on the screen. I may be changing screens in about a few seconds, so if you need to jot something down, of course, this is all archived. You can always come back to it. I would like to thank our sponsors for helping us make this com conference possible. And, uh, the, and the, uh, the sponsors are CoreSmart, MediaSite, and Blackboard Collaborate. And oh, here we go, there's the slide. <laughs> and um, they will be having some sessions throughout the conference. I know we only have one more day, but you might want to check the schedule for dates and times. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this, this session. And I also, again, want to thank all the presenters. You guys did a great job. And I want to thank you all. And thank when you, you do, very much. And I just want to say, and when you do leave this session, please make sure you exit out. All right, folks, thank you all for attending and hope to see you at the next session. Great. Thank you.